The experience of our country demonstrates once again that the Communist Party can fulfill its role of the vanguard political force only if it is linked by thousands of fibres to the working class, to the people from whose ranks it was born. If it loyally and selflessly serves the interests of the people, the cause of socialism. When, in the West, we are broadcast images of the 20th century socialist past, the transmissions evoke feelings of dislocation and homesickness. We observe a world that is instinctively alien to us, cold, remote, a vision of a future that was never realized, a vision that was the future once upon a time, but one so distant from our present objective reality, it seems now to us to be completely intangible unfathomable. The distance between us and the people in these pictures is further accentuated by the bias of the historical record. The implosion of socialist construction in Romania, and in those countries formerly belonging to the USSR, was supposed to earmark the ending of a global ideological conflict. In the same year that Ceausescu and his wife were publicly deposed and executed, economic historian Robert Heilbronner confidently proclaimed that, quote, the contest between capitalism and socialism is over. Capitalism has won." End quote. It's well known and understood that the victors ordinarily give form to the histories, and accordingly, in the bourgeois annals, nary a written trace can be discerned that seeks to detail the ground-level reality of the Romanian socialist experiment. In place of a thorough investigation, we in the West have settled for a set of assumptions that fill the space and ensure our unthinking complacency. Assumptions that are themselves anchored only in the spectral images of the past, broadcast into our retinas, and the feelings of homesickness these pictures engineer in us. But then, slowly but surely, confusion sets in as we uncover concrete evidence that might confound our preconceived version of events. We discover that 30 years after the fall of Romanian socialism, many of its former subjects now desire its resurrection. We observe immigrant workers in our countries grafting in harsh conditions for minuscule remittance money and wonder about the quality of the economic conditions that drove their relocation. Who is right and who is wrong in their interpretation of the past? Did socialism really fail the Romanian people? How can we make sense of events so apparently remote from our own reality? How can we place Romania's socialist experiment in its proper context and better explicate its legacy? In the first instance, we must go back we must unflinchingly reckon with the conditions that gave rise to Romania's socialistic mode of production, and without prejudice, attempt to trace the untold history of the socialist era. Let's proceed to unlearn and rediscover. The nation that we now know as Romania was moulded in the lifeblood of ancient Dacian and Roman civilizations. Writing of Romania's unique historical character in the 20th century, American historian Paul McKendrick opined that, quote, the Romanians are fully entitled to our attention as conveyors of Greco-Roman culture in the Middle Ages, as members of one of the most remarkably creative Aboriginal states of ancient times, as victims and beneficiaries of Rome's last conquered and first deserted province, Dacia, and as preservers after the Romans' retreat of a mixture of autochthonous and classical culture, which accounts for their country's uniqueness among the European socialist grouping. End quote. The third century bore witness to the collapse of Roman rule. The then Emperor Aurelian would signal for Roman presence to retract south of the Danube River, thus heralding the disintegration of Greco-Roman hegemony. The retrenchment of Roman forces would catalyse a centuries-long period of political instability, with waves of migration disrupting the possibility of a sustained settlement for the Dacian peoples. For a time, the Ottomans would lay claim to the Romanian soil, for a time, the Habsburg and Tsarist empires, but none would be able to maintain a permanent foothold in the region. Writing of the fractious and unsettled nature of Romanian development in the medieval period, one Ceausescu biographer stated that, quote, throughout the Middle Ages, the Romanian people had to suffer and cope through great material and human sacrifices with the interference of foreign empires and the damage and plunders inflicted on them by its forerunners, end quote. Later in time, Romania's communist leader, Nicolae Ceausescu, would gain fleeting credibility in the West for assertively cultivating an independent Romanian foreign policy and national identity. 
in encouraging a socialist culture born of Dacian soil, the Romanian Communist Party would attempt to connect their political project to an innate historical tapestry. Gorgeo Dej, Ceausescu, and other revolutionary figures would be interfaced onto a bygone lineage of national folk heroes, including Decebalus, the last king of Dacia, who united his territory in resistance to the tide of Roman conquest, and Michael the Brave, who would transiently unite the fractured provinces of Transylvania, Wallachia, and Moldavia in the early 17th century. Ceausescu's confident assertion of an independent foreign and domestic practice, then, was clearly rooted in a particular reading of Romanian history. Through this lens, Romania had long been engaged in a brutal and ancient struggle for self-determination and unification. Her adoption of the socialist mode of production, a higher mode of social organisation, was only the latest advance in a protracted struggle for national self-actualization. After loosening herself from dwindling Ottoman influence, Romania would be unified as two provinces and adorned with its namesake in 1862. Monarchic rule would endure in Romania into and beyond the interwar era. In spite of the conservative character of the state, the early 20th century saw the emergence of Romania as a modern nation. Commenting on the period in question, Ceausescu remarked that, quote, The formation of the unitary Romanian state is not a gift. It is not the result of an international conference. It is the result of the tireless struggle for unity waged by the most progressive forces of society and by the broad masses of the people, a natural outcome of the historical, social and national development of the Romanian people." End quote. Concurrent with the late monarchical period, a surreptitious but growing workers' movement was taking embryonic form in the country. Antagonism often acts as the engine of history, and so it was the case in early 20th century Romania. As the nascent workers' movement gained traction, so too did the nation's hard right flank. The socialism of fools, in fits and starts, surfaced in Romania. By the 1930s, the Iron Guard, a revolutionary fascist group led by Horia Sima, was attracting mainstream media and popular support. Maria Lupus writes that, quote, Many newspapers evolved towards the right during the 1930s, and for varying reasons, including the personal positions of the editors, and the political shift of the ruling political parties during a series of right-wing dictatorships." End quote. In the wake of Carol II's rulership, the National Legionary State was founded in 1940, comprising an ultra-nationalist coalition, Ion Antonescu, a decorated World War I hero and far-right conservative, united with the Iron Guard in support of Nazi Germany. Antonescu's fascist cabal oversaw the deportation of upwards of 400,000 Jews, and would contribute significant manpower to the fatefully decisive Operation Barbarossa on the Eastern Front. Soon, however, the tables would begin to turn on the Axis powers. Communists in Romania waited patiently for the arrival of the Red Army, who to many represented an emancipatory force, such were the horrors witnessed on the watch of the fascists. In 1944, after a series of Allied bombing raids over Romania in the previous year, the Red Army did arrive and the Soviet liberation would establish the foundations for a decades-long experiment in socialism within the redrawn, war-torn Romanian territories. In 1947, a people's dictatorship was founded, heralding the dawn of the Romanian socialist era. Prior to the advent of Romanian socialism, the country had been mired in technological and agricultural underdevelopment. In the decades prior to communist rule, the small but growing bourgeoisie had failed to make significant capital investments in industry due to limits on profitability. Now, however, the Romanian Communist Party would embark on an ambitious remaking of the country. Using the mechanism of rational central planning, the party would place a high priority on national industrialization in order to develop the forces of production and correspondingly raise the living standards of the masses. Two leaders would go on to hold the role of General Secretary of the Romanian Communist Party. Gorge Gorgeo Dej, from 1947 to 1965, and Nicolae Ceausescu, from 1965 until the dissolution of Socialist Romania in 1989. This video's analysis will extend to encompass the achievements and failings of both eras. Quote, the years of 1946 to 1947 were most difficult. 
Two consecutive years of drought had considerably worsened Romania's economic situation. Starvation was a menace to tens upon thousands of families." End quote. After the expelling of the Nazi menace, Romania lay in ruins, and many were hungry. Daniel Sherrott, writing in 1978, stated that, quote, "...agricultural backwardness is an old Romanian problem." End quote. Despite his anti-communist politics, Sherrott would credit collectivization with gradually dealing with the problem of hunger and lacklustre food production. The communists expropriated the arable areas formerly belonging to the landowning classes and redistributed these areas to the peasantry. The early 1950s saw a mixed approach to agriculture. Familial cultivation remained dominant even as collectivization was gradually introduced and encouraged. Food production levels would remain lower than pre-war levels until the implementation of collective agriculture was reprioritized. This was, for the most part, completed by the early 1960s, and by historical standards, had been achieved with limited antagonism and violence. By the early 1960s, collectives accounted for 75% of arable control. Production of industrial and consumer crops grew by around 1,000% between the 1930s and the 1970s, and the collectivization drive also ensured the successful diversification of agriculture, away from exclusive production of cereals. In the Parliament of the 1930s, 20 to 25 percent of the representatives were from the large landowning families. In the era of Romanian socialism, however, the politics of noblesse oblige would be eviscerated to pave the way for the representation of the working class. By the end of the 1940s, the old aristocracy was dismantled. What limited amount of bourgeois industry had subsisted in pre-socialist Romania was expropriated by the state, and the middle ranks of the bourgeoisie saw their wealth confiscated in 1947 via currency reform. Those elements of the intelligentsia, old civil service and business elite that were compliant with socialist rule were integrated back into the Romanian Communist Party. However, those who would work to obstruct the arrival of socialism were arrested and imprisoned. The Romanian Communist Party drew contrast with the extreme policies exercised in fraternal socialist nation-states. They were able to successfully channel religious belief into socialist construction. Romanian Orthodoxy was mandated as the national religion for those who wished to preserve their theistic beliefs, and the church was subsumed into the socialist state. Church properties and wealth was confiscated, thus eliminating religion's institutional power with a stroke. By 1950, the old order had been displaced. The 1950s would see the electrification of Romania. A 10-year plan was dedicated to the generation of electrical power to span the entire country through a national grid. Where in the early years of Romanian socialism, the country had produced 1.5 billion kilowatts of electrical energy. By the mid-1960s, this had increased to 70 billion kilowatts. By the year 1980, socialism had delivered affordable housing for the masses. 4.6 million homes were built to house Romania's population and to encourage urbanization. Overcrowding and social crises that were typical of urbanization in other countries were not so present in Romania's development drive. This is largely because the socialist government was careful to proliferate industry throughout the country, thereby easing the burden of urbanization to major hubs such as Bucharest. Pregnant women and mothers were accorded rights which were noted by bourgeois reviewers as comprehensive and generous. For the first time in Romanian history, women were recognized as equal under the law and were afforded equal pay to their male counterparts. Ceausescu noted of women's equality that, quote, equality with men does not result spontaneously from the triumph of the new social relations. It is accomplished in step with the development of the socialist system. Women's progress in socialist Romania can be measured in their political representation. Women comprised 33% of the total number of the deputies in the Grand National Assembly, 
thousands of women came to represent their trade unions as chairwomen. This kind of frontline representation was historically leaps and bounds ahead of the capitalist West. Illiteracy among females was eliminated by the 1980s, and by 1970, some 74.9% of working age women were employed outside the home. By 1945, the Romanian Communist Party's ranks would swell to 600,000 members. Although large in number, the party needed to integrate itself with the Romanian masses. The authoritative position of the Communist Party had largely been attained as a result of historical happenstance. During the war, their membership numbers were negligible. Therefore, the meshing of the party with Romanian history and culture was a necessity in order to establish and maintain relevance and reciprocity with the people. As was previously mentioned, Romania was a country that had historically struggled for an independent form of existence and expression. Centuries of occupation and exploitation had contributed to a strong national desire for economic and political advancement. In party propaganda, officials correctly associated Romania's socialist political program with this latent desire for national rejuvenation. Only as a result of historical development were conditions ripe for the implementation of socialist policies. Therefore, it was logical to place Romania's socialist project within the historical, national context. Folk heroes of Romanian history were lauded and celebrated at parades, and the achievements of Giorgio Dej and Ceausescu were presented as a culmination of progressive struggles of patriotic Romanians through time. As a country that had largely been marginalised and underdeveloped until the advent of socialism, this rehabilitation and celebration of a new national culture was an appropriate and liberating political measure. After the socialists took power, rational planning became the economic motive force in Romanian society. Gone was the need for a reserve army of labour and for people's skills and talents to be left unrealised. Instead, full employment became the policy of the day with each and every Romanian being provided with a job. The full utilisation of the Romanian workforce would act as a spur for the nation's industrial engine. For the first time in Romanian history, the heavy anxiety associated with idleness and underemployment evaporated. A historic prerequisite for the initiation of socialist construction is the successful nationalisation of the domestic economy. After the socialists took power, the workers' state took control of the means of production. All sectors of the economy were gradually nationalised, and by 1965, Romania had made substantial headway in socialising its economic assets. Ceausescu, speaking in 1987, commented that, quote, one cannot speak of a socialist economy and not assume the socialist ownership of the means of production as its basis, end quote. The state controlled all natural resources except for a steadily declining amount of agriculturally marginal land still in private hands. The nationalisation of the domestic economy ensured that the Romanian government could allocate resources on the grounds of need rather than for profit. Compared to other socialist states, Romania advocated heavily for state ownership and control. Even cooperatives, which at various times had been encouraged in Soviet Russia and the People's Republic of China, were suppressed in Romania in favour of state farms which were allocated the lion's share of land, fertiliser and machinery. Quote, All European communist economies have stressed industrial growth, but Romania since 1958 has done so to an extraordinary degree. Romanian industrial production in recent decades has grown proportionately more rapidly than that of any other European country." End quote. The successful industrialization of the country was seen as essential by the Romanian Communist Party. Only via the industrial road could the living standards of the people be raised. Ceausescu's government initiated a crucial five-year plan spanning the year 1960 to 65. The plan saw that 35% of all government economic investment went into developing fuels and electric power, 25% into metallurgy and machine building, and 14% into the chemical industry. Economist Kalim Siddiqui 
commenting on industrialization as a means of developing the forces of production broadly, writes that, quote, Economic development requires a transformation of the productive structure, which was mainly achieved through industrialization. Historically, rapid economic growth and improvement of economic conditions have been associated with the expansion of manufacturing. It depends on investment, particularly by the government through the use of fiscal policy, as happened during post-war Europe, when the state not only nationalized key industries, but also increased funding in research and development of new technologies. It certainly did not leave these crucial aspects to the private sector only." End quote. Until the advent of Romanian socialism, the country had been reliant on the capital investment of the small bourgeoisie present in the country. However, due to constraints on profitability, capitalists were hesitant to invest in the industry that would benefit the social needs of the country. Romania's adoption of socialist policies acted to liberate the nation's economic frontiers. Now the country could reprioritize the manufacturing of high-quality goods for foreign export and domestic use. Ceausescu's promotion of an expansive, modernizing industrial policy was only possible in defiance of Soviet diktat. Khrushchev's Soviet leadership wanted Romania to act as a breadbasket for the Soviet Union and tried to encourage agricultural development in place of an industrial program. Quote, this would have helped the Soviets by lessening the primary product dependence of the advanced communist states and freed Soviet primary exports for trade with the West. Khrushchev's call for greater rationalization in the communist division of labor and for greater integration of the European Eastern economies thus presented the Romanian elite with a major problem. It threatened to change the entire direction taken since 1947 and strongly affirmed in 1957. The Romanian elite was faced by cognitive dissonance Everything it had believed and worked for was threatened." End quote. In staring down the Soviets and preserving their economic sovereignty, the Romanians isolated themselves from Soviet aid, but managed to uphold their industrial policy, which, even according to the mainstream accounts, was successful in modernizing the economic base of the country with comparatively less friction than other industrial revolutions. Healthcare in socialist Romania was provided free of charge by the state and, at least in theory, to all citizens. Between 1940 and 1980, annual expenditures for public health increased considerably. There was a concurrent rise in the number of physicians and hospital beds available to the population. In 1950, there were 9.1 physicians and 41.6 hospital beds per 10,000 people. By 1971, these numbers had risen to 12.1 and 84.7, respectively. Infant mortality decreased from 116.7 deaths per 1,000 live births in 1950 to 49.4 per 1,000 in 1970, and to only 23.4 per 1,000 in 1984. Over the same period, life expectancy rose for men from 61.5 to 67 years, and for women from 65 to 72.6 years. Romania had suffered strained foreign relations with Moscow from the conception of their socialist experiment. Soviet Russia exacted high war reparations on Romania for their role in facilitating the Nazis' eastward expansion. Additionally, with the ascent of the Khrushchev faction came a pivot in foreign and domestic Soviet policy and the reappraising of Romania's role within the fraternal family of socialist nations. Where policies of industrialization had been encouraged, now a more agricultural and consumer focus was being emphasized by the Kremlin. The Romanian political elite felt ostracized by the economic and political pressures emanating from Moscow, and so they sought to engineer relations with the People's Republic of China and the capitalist West. Romania's flirtation with the imperialist world, in particular, had dire consequences in the realm of foreign affairs. The country would become the first among socialist nations to officially recognize and legitimize West Germany and Israel. When the CIA overthrew Hollande's socialist government in Chile, Romania maintained relations with Hollande's fascist successors. We can't pretend that realpolitik wasn't an influence on Romania's foreign policy stances. Ceausescu was able to simultaneously forge more beneficial trading relations with the technologically advanced United States on the one hand, 
and benefit from the development of agriculture through collaboration with Israel. Romania's relations with the West, however, would ultimately become emblematic of a geopolitical Faustian pact. When Romania required aid in order to fund national investments in housing stock, for instance, Ceausescu's government turned to the Western creditors with favourable capital enticement. This would later existentially threaten the Romanian socialist experiment, but more on that later. Marxists understand socialism as a transitional stage between capitalism and communism. Socialist construction in this framework is understood as a process as opposed to an event. This can often lead to some strange contradictions emerging from the political fabric of a society in flux. Some commentators have made the compelling case that Romania's particular form of political organization came to resemble a kind of socialist corporatism. Quote, in the late 1960s, bright young men had been sent to replace party individuals at the various critical levels of the economy. The older, generally less competent party functionaries were loyal to the party as a corporate group, whereas the technically competent younger personnel tended to identify with the needs of the particular sector of the economy in which they worked." End quote. As various interest groups, agricultural, technical and otherwise, were streamlined through socialization, so too followed their formalization into corporate type bodies. Romanian sociologist Cernia, writing of the corporatization of agriculture, stated that, quote, the need was felt to strengthen this functional integration with organizational integration, so that there would be created sustainable conditions for the integration of cooperatist agriculture into the entire national economic planning and development process, end quote. These forms of political organization created a competitive structure to spur innovation in the socialist system, but they likewise created centers of political power that could undermine the Communist Party's leadership. Those intellectuals that were welcomed back into the Communist fold after the purges of the 1950s came to represent a lingering, re-emergent bourgeois threat to the vanguard. The cyclical growth in corporate power and the corresponding purges that would re-establish party dominance represented a destabilizing bulwark to economic progress during the Ceausescu years. The 1970s would bear witness to the first ruptures in the Romanian socialist system. After Khrushchev came to power, the Soviets recommended that the Romanians focus more closely on the export of petrol and agricultural goods. This advice was refused by the Romanian government, who favoured policies of rapid industrialization. Romania had been able to increase oil exports alongside expanding its modernising industrial sector until 1978, when shockwaves resulting from the wider energy crisis of the same decade began to impact upon Romania. All manpower reserves had been tapped, shortages of consumer goods sapped worker enthusiasm, and low labour productivity dulled the effectiveness of a relatively modern industrial facility. After decades of growth, oil output began to decline. The downturn forced Romania to import oil at prices too high to allow its huge new petrochemical plants to operate profitably. Coal, electricity and natural gas production also fell short of planned targets, creating chaos throughout the economy. A devastating earthquake, drought, higher world interest rates, soft foreign demand for Romanian goods and higher prices for petroleum imports pushed Romania into a balance of payments crisis. In 1981, Romania followed Poland in becoming the second Comic-Con country to request rescheduling of its hard currency debts, notifying bankers in italics from Bucharest that it would make no payments on its arrears or on the next year's obligations without a rescheduling agreement. The infrastructural damage induced by an earthquake and the simultaneous broader global economic crisis ensured a significant faltering in the Romanian economy. The Romanian people had experienced advancement in living conditions from the advent of Romanian socialism until the late 70s. Now, however, Romania's over-reliance on aid and investment from the imperial core would come back to bite the socialist project. The Romanian government never shied from their founding mission, and for the majority of the Dej and Ceausescu era, the Communist Party consciously and transformationally pushed the country down the socialist road. 
in the absence of any good information about Romania's socialist experiment, many figures belonging to both the political left and right have sought instead to caricature Romania's authentic attempt at socialist construction. Ceausescu's infamous and well-documented fraternization with the West is often relayed as evidence of the leader's covetousness and revisionism. In actuality, much of Romania's imperialist association was driven by pragmatic domestic concern. As has been previously mentioned, Romania had defied the Kremlin in order to bolster their own domestic program of rapid industrialization. This political decision came at the cost of Soviet trade and investment. Therefore, Ceausescu's government appealed westward, seeking inward capital investment and advanced foreign technological imports alongside export of its products to hard currency markets. Prior to the oil crisis of the 70s, Romania had been able to secure favourable loans from the West in return for their export of petroleum. In moves that signified their deepening relationship with the West, Romania joined the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1971, and in 1972 it became the first Comic-Con country to join the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Quote, If until 1980 the IMF strategy only recommended policies, more or less general and or unconditional, Following the 1981 to 1983 debt crisis, which affected more than 30 countries, the strategy changed radically, having as its objective the avoidance of debt payments arrears and focusing on preventative aims by imposing certain conditions in providing the financial support. These conditions included, among others, the slowing down of industrialization, the increase of prices for natural gas and food, and the imposition of budgetary austerity." End quote. Quote, a direct consequence of this new approach was that, if the lending banks refused to reschedule the debts of some countries, the IMF would also suspend their access to funding. For all four types of standby arrangements, the IMF made mandatory the letters of intent from the governments requesting for financial support, with the description of policies intended to be implemented, the performance criteria and quarterly reporting, etc. Starting in the 1980s, the World Bank also imposed structural adjustment programs for debtor countries, focusing on the devaluation of national currencies, the elimination of subsidies, the reduction of spending on education, health and social assistance, and so on. The financial support being related to four levels of conditionality, fiduciary, institutional, measurable results and economic policies, focused on economic and trade liberalization, price liberalization, privatization, and restructuring of state-owned companies." End quote. The Romanian government, once caught in the debt trap laid for them by the Western financial institutions, took steps to preserve their socialist economy. They did not compromise the integral structure of the Romanian socialist system through restructuring, but instead sought to pay down the foreign debt through the massive export of agricultural goods. This directly led to shortages in the domestic economy and food queues at the stores. In order to pay off the foreign debt, Ceausescu imposed a crash program. The government cut imports, slashed domestic electricity usage, enacted stiff penalties against hoarding, and squeezed its farms, factories, and refineries for exports. The debt reduction policies resulted in severe shortages of bread, meat, fruits, and vegetables. By 1989, the debt burden had been paid off, but the damage of 10 years of draconian austerity measures had seen a weakening in popular support for Romania's socialist project. The nature of Romanian socialism was not static or fixed. The Ceausescu era in particular can be understood best in its fluidity. Like in other countries that have laid claim to the socialist mantle, an evolving dialectic between centralization and democratization can be observed on a closer inspection of the period in question. The Romanian government would oscillate in its policy orientation. The early 1960s played host to a period of liberalization in tandem with the growth of competition between the different corporate type bodies in civic life. However, the Communist Party was careful not to allow these democratic trends to undermine their central authority. In 1971, Ceausescu visited Pyongyang and evidently took inspiration from the strong bond of national unity he saw embodied in the Korean peoples. On his return, the Ceausescu faction reasserted control over political life. 
liberal influence in the Communist Party was marginalised with the demotion of Ion Ilyashku, a youth leader in the movement who personified the growing technocratic tendencies of the younger generation. Ceausescu would seek to actively invigorate national unity via the promotion of a personality cult which would come to encompass not just himself, but also close members of his family, most prominently his wife, Elena Ceausescu. The cult would be sustained and fostered via media institutions that were loyal to the Communist Party. The media system itself was a highly centralised interlocking group of party and state organisations, supervising bodies and operating agencies, whose authority extended to all forms of mass media. The kinetic contradiction between centralisation and democratisation can be seen represented in the 1965 constitution, which simultaneously guaranteed freedom of information whilst also expressing the reservation that this freedom does not hold true for those who would promote, quote, aims hostile to the socialist system and to the interests of the working people, end quote. As Marxists, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can recognise that forms of personality cult and hero worship are at odds with a class analysis of history and society, whilst also acknowledging the necessity of centralisation as a means to prop proletarian dictatorship. In 1988, the Romanian government made clear their intention to increase the rate and pace of systematisation, a programme for the rapid urbanisation of rural life in the country. Launched in the 1970s, systematisation was conceived as personifying Romania's drive for contemporaneous modernisation and unification. The Hungarian minority in the country were vocal in their criticism of systematisation, especially in the dying days of the Ceausescu regime. Those who felt aggrieved protest against the plans to destroy and relocate 1,500 ethnic Hungarian villages. The Romanian communists felt that the rapid urbanisation of villages and hamlets would more quickly advance the process of socialist construction. Historically, systematisation had been tacitly supported by the imperial court because it had embodied Romanian defiance of Kremlin diktat. However, that was then, and this was now. By the time of the late 1980s, the West, in collusion with Gorbachev's bourgeois clique, were now fermenting discontent in Hungary. Romania's program of urbanisation, previously a maverick policy proposal, was now conveyed in distorted fashion by the imperial court as embodying the oppression of minority rights. Of course, there were very good reasons for Ceausescu's promotion of systematisation. The policy had, by the 1980s, successfully elevated the material conditions of many formerly belonging to the subsistence peasantry. However, in true Ceausescu fashion, the policy was accelerated with bloody-minded determination, without much thought given to public relations during a period of uttermost peril for the Romanian socialist project. <laughs> А все было на мази, мази. Вы представляете, если бы раскол и борьба за власть в стране такой, как наша, перенасыщенная оружием, включая и ядерное, это значит, что Горбачеву для того, чтобы удержаться у власти, пошел на вот это все. Людей бы сколько уробили, разрушений все. Нет, это не, не мог допустить. И моя победа состоит в том, что я покинул власть. In April 1989, the Romanian government declared the country free of Western debt and reaffirmed their ongoing commitment to their system of command and control. In the same time period, the wider socialist world was experiencing violent existential convulsions. The previously solid foundations of the USSR were being eroded by extreme deviationist strains of ideological revisionism. Mikhail Gorbachev's conversion to liberal reformism was more gradual than Damascene, but his active promotion of subversive ideological traitors and saboteurs to positions of political power was intentional. The first hammer blow to the socialist world came with the Communist Party of the Soviet Union's implementation of Glasnost in 1985. The reform program's intellectual godfather was one Alexander Yakovlev, who makes no secret of his history as an internal fifth columnist. 
Commenting on Glasnost, Yakovlev stated that, quote, We chose a simple, like a sledgehammer, method of propagating the ideas of late Lenin, to strike with the authority of Lenin at Stalin, at Stalinism, and then if successful, to strike with Plekhanov and social democracy at Lenin. The Soviet totalitarian regime could only be destroyed through Glasnost and totalitarian party discipline, while hiding behind the interests of improving socialism, end quote. The Gorbachev faction felt that market reform could only be sustained in the Soviet Union, with broader opposition to the traditional party nomenclatura. So in order to bolster their efforts at economic restructuring, central party leaders granted countries within the USSR greater political autonomy and began instituting liberal democratic reforms to revive bourgeois democracy. In spite of his isolation from the international community, Ceausescu was a loud and vocal critic of Moscow. And perhaps this shouldn't surprise us, as his country was also a victim of the destabilizing ramifications of Soviet reform. The socialist project that the USSR had given life to was now in grave danger, and the reverberations of Gorbachev's Glasnost reforms would be felt keenly throughout the socialist world. During the 1980s, Romania had become ever more reliant on the Soviet Union as a source of raw materials and technology. In the absence of Western trade in the wake of Ceausescu's domestic austerity program, Romanian planners were fearful that intimate association with the hyper-revisionist Soviet Union would intensify calls for domestic political and economic reform. Communist Sam Marcy, writing of Soviet pressure in the Council of Mutual Economic Assistance, opined that, quote, Soviet reforms were not meant merely as a national policy. They were also to be imported into its coordinating body for economic relations among the socialist countries, end quote. In light of these ominous broad trends, the Romanian Communist Party continued to place a strong emphasis on the pursuit of political autarky in an attempt to preserve their socialist system. Consequently, unpopular policies such as the extreme rationing of goods outlived the period of debt repayment to the West. Mass discontent at Romania's protracted program of austerity was the key driver of anti-government feeling in the country during the twilight weeks of Romanian socialism. Finally, on December the 22nd of 1989, discontent fermented into counter-revolution. American-backed protests were supported domestically by formerly disgraced politicians, such as Ion Iliescu. The color revolutionaries sought and secured the defection of the armed forces, and as a result, quickly secured victory. Ceausescu and his wife would be dead by Christmas, and with it the dream of a multilaterally developed socialist society in the Romanian territories. The immediate aftermath of counter-revolution would see the criminalization of the Communist Party. The ostensibly left-leaning National Salvation Front, which had already been groomed for power, began the material process of deconstructing Romania's socialist achievements in earnest. In January 1990, Washington instructed its Bucharest envoy to take preliminary actions in encouraging the process of privatization. With a few strokes of the pen, Romania was brought into the orbit of global capitalism. State-owned enterprises were sold to foreign profiteers and legal steps were taken to ensure wholesale foreign ownership in investments. After capitalist restoration, price controls that had provided access to dwindling, rationed goods were removed. Wages increased but did not keep up with the price of living, and a hyperinflationary crisis came to grip Romania for the entirety of the 90s, levelling out towards the end of the decade and then resuming with the halting of subsidies. Unemployment, previously consigned to history, now reared its ugly head once more, and the menaces of idleness and deprivation became widespread. Millions would become unemployed as the socialist system was destroyed. Many desperate Romanians turned to a prominent Ponzi scheme called Caritas, as a harsh transition to capitalism immersed more Romanians in dire poverty. It's estimated that between 35 and 50% of Romanian households were involved in the scheme. Millions of families lost a collective $1 billion, even in spite of the government's awareness of the existence of the fraud. Today, Romania's economy is heavily propped by a low-wage tourism sector and remittance funds funneled back into the country by individuals who have been forced to travel to the West to find work. The country's economy and natural resources, once the preserve of the worker's state, are now open to the control of foreign capital. The industrial program that had given meaning to the Ceausescu project 
died in the 90s with the withdrawal of the state from economic planning. The study of Romania's socialist project is a fearsome undertaking. The poverty of sound information relating to the Dej Ceausescu era has left many alive today unacquainted with the size, scale and ambition of the nation's 20th century advancement. Ceausescu is often rightly and brutally criticised for his failings as a leader, but can we say unreservedly that Romania's socialist experiment is appraised with any kind of objectivity? In reading about the time period in question, I've been particularly struck by the threadbare fickleness of the historical record. In bourgeois history, Ceausescu resembles a mere zombified constitution and far less a flawed human being with achievements and failings to his name. When, in the 1970s, the capitalist West stood to profit from the late Romanian leader's defiant politics, we saw this lifeless form animated with colour. Ceausescu the Maverick was born. We then witnessed the same vibrancy of character extinguished in a mere flourish, and the bogeyman Ceausescu reanimated so soon as the bourgeois narrators smelt blood. The discipline of history is the product of the economic milieu that gives rise to our existence. It isn't uniform or determinate, but its form corresponds to the base of production that breathes life into our cultural institutions. In this way, Romania's socialist past was never supposed to be of our authentic concern, nor the broader socialist histories of the 20th century. These histories intersected with a different mode of production. They seemed always out of eye shot, somewhere over there, beyond our reach. Now, however, the infinite possibility of the information age provides us a new permission to unlearn and retouch the old histories. It's up to us as socialists to give context, definition and clarity to the phantom-like images of the 20th century past. To re-piece the socialist history, not as a static, lifeless and monochromatic artefact, but as a technicolor tapestry, constant only in its fluidity and expanse. When Ceausescu was marched to his execution, he had fallen afoul of the Romanian masses. Years of austerity had severed the war-forged bond between the communist leadership and the Romanian people. But the legacy of Romania's socialist project was not anchored to the regime's downfall. Recent polling evidence demonstrates amply that those who lived under socialism now view its legacy favourably. Many desire its restoration. They understand Ceausescu not as an unfeeling monster or a caricature, but as a gigantic and flawed national figure, whose ambitions, more than any other, lit the fires of historic progress in the Romanian territories. A man who joined the communist ranks in his infancy and who died singing the international. The Romanian people have re-evaluated a history that is materially and spiritually relevant to them. Upon closer inspection of the same era, surely it's about time that we do the same.